I'm Richard and uh, one of my hobbies is collecting old computers, mainly from the 1980s. And every year I enter the Retro Challenge, which is a month long excuse to do something cool with old computers and tell other people about it. And this time last year, I worked on a couple of these um, suitcase sized uh, Osborne One portable computers, um, uh, generally regarded as the first portable computer in the world. And I've fully restored one of them. The second one, there was problems with the disk controller circuitry that I couldn't diagnose because I lacked the right tools to do so. Um, and I thought I'd probably need an oscilloscope, although people later pointed out that I could probably um, get, since it's just digital electronics, I could use simpler tools like a logic analyzer or even a logic probe to have a go. Uh, so for this year's March Retro Challenge, I decided to get myself some digital diagnostic tools, which are a bit cheaper than a full bone oscilloscope, and have a go at fixing some of these computers. I haven't worked on the Osborne one yet, because that's quite a big project and I was a bit lacking time this year. Uh, so instead, uh, there's one computer missing from the cabinet here, uh, because it's out um, being worked on, uh, which is a Video Genie computer. It's a quite an obscure um, uh, computer that not many people know about, uh, but I have a very soft spot for it because it was the first computer that my family owned. Um, so in this video I want to give a little bit of talk about what the Video Genie was and uh, the significance and why it's significant to me. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a couple of dead Video Genies that I've managed to bring back to life over the course of this uh, Retro Challenge. Um, and I'm going to give quite a high level kind of view of what I, what I discovered was wrong and how I fixed it. Um, uh, I've done some uh, earlier videos that went into um, kind of real-time diagnostics following me diagnosing them, which if you're very interested in the technical details you could have a look at. Uh, but I'm going to keep this fairly high level so it's kind of quite accessible video. And at the end I'll just um, summarise what's still to be done uh, for um, a future challenge maybe. Let's uh, move over there and have a look at these Video Genie computers. So here we have a selection of my Video Genie computers. Um, the Video Genie was uh, created in the late 70s. Um, I first saw it in 1980 um, by a company from Hong Kong called EACA. And their idea was to capitalise on the success of the Tandy Radio Shack TOS-80, which is one of the three big popular machines in the late 70s. Uh, I've got a TOS-80 Model 3 here, but this was a clone of the TOS-80 Model 1. Um, and so they kind of reverse engineered the, the, the design, made pretty much a complete clone. There's hardly any um, hardware or software differences, all Tandy. Uh, TOS-80 software runs on these machines. Um, they managed to get away without any lawsuits by licensing the basic interpreter uh, directly from Microsoft. So Tandy had uh, licensed um, the interpreter from Microsoft. Um, rather than going to Tandy, uh, EACA went straight to Microsoft and bought a license. Um, but then they almost completely cloned the ROM out of the TOS-80, which was like 95% was the Microsoft software, but there was like, you know, 5% that is uh, all the other bits. Um, but the yeah, uh, Radio Shack never sued them. Um, EACA only um, lasted for about two years and then they went out of business. Maybe if they'd been more successful or last longer, they, they might have uh, seen more legal action. Uh, in the UK, where I am, uh, it was released as the Video Genie. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, it was called the System 80, and it was called something else in the rest of Europe. Um, I don't think it ever made it to the United States. Um, so I have uh, three uh, machines here and uh, peripherals, uh, so I'll just go into a little bit of detail about what all those are. The Video Genie came in two main uh, models. The first one they released, known as the EG3003, had a built-in cassette deck, which uh, um, made it uh, quite advantageous compared to the TOS-80 that had a separate cassette deck. Um, full travel keyboard, um, far-fetching 
fake wood panelling on the side for the uh, for the time. Uh, it was a really impressive console. And they later came out with the Genie 2, the EG3008, uh, which had no cassette deck, so you had to use it with the disc interface system, which is this 3014 expansion unit. Uh, much like the TRS-80 Model 1 expansion unit, uh, it adds disk interface, uh, it adds uh, memory upgrades, so from 16K up to 48K, um, and uh, printer interface and optional serial. The Genie went through a number of revisions. I think this is the second revision from the keyboard, because the first one was missing the arrow keys that the TRS-80 had. The second revision added these keys in, although they weren't marked as arrows. You had backspace and tab instead of left and right arrow, and escape and control instead of up and down arrow. But at least it had the full keyboard. And then what I think is the third revision, they um, uh, replaced them with arrow keys, which was a lot more useful. And they also added a meter and a volume control for the cassette deck, which made tape... Um, uh, recording, saving and loading a lot more reliable. And the other difference with the TRS-80 was with the screen display that is always 64 characters by 16 lines but the Genie has a hardware switch on the back that allows you to switch it into a 32 character mode with a page button that will flip between the left and the right pages on the screen. The TRS-80 did have a 32 character mode, but that was invoked in software. Uh, and the Genie simulates that software mode by just putting spaces in between uh, each character in 64 character mode. So my personal history with these machines is this machine here is identical to the one that I had as a um, teenager and that I more or less learned to program on started on ZX80, a borrowed ZX80, but then this was spent two years teaching myself basic and then Z80 assembly language on it. This is the first one I acquired because um, we did, no longer had the, uh, the one I had from the 1980s. I got this from a Radio Rally for three pounds or six pounds, something like that, unknown condition, uh, but it didn't work. Um, then I found somebody on Twitter who was trying to um, clear out uh, three uh, video genies to a good home. And so I said, yes, please, uh, which is this one. Uh, he then had some family problems and wasn't able to send it for quite a long time. Uh, so I bought this one on eBay. So Genie 2, which I'd always wanted with the disc interface, which now means that I can, um, I don't have to use cassettes. Uh, I've got a um, GoTech floppy emulator rather than using the huge double disc drive that came with that one. Um, and that arrived and worked and it was great. And then finally this one came through about a year later, uh, but sadly it was also not working. So in the Retro Challenge um, this month, I've got uh, these two uh, mostly up and working. And I'll go into the details of what I've done and what still needs to be done. So these are a few of the tools that I used for diagnosing the problems. Uh, the thing that started all, all off was getting this uh, logic analyzer, which plugs into a computer via USB, and you have all these little clips that you can uh, you can attach to uh, the circuit board, and you can look at 16 parts of the circuit at once and all graph them on the computer monitor, uh, and you can scroll back and look at the history of what's changing state so you can diagnose digital logic circuit series and ones and this is a much cruder thing a logic probe you just connect it into the circuit board and touch the tip on places and it will tell you if a given pin is low or high or is neither or is even oscillating so you can see if data is being transferred um, and i tested out both of those in the end i didn't you need to use the logic analyzer in these repairs. I did use the Logic Probe a little bit. So I was quite lucky when I got, uh, I think it was the Genie 2, I got the uh, service manual with it, which is incredibly useful, lists of all the components in the machine, um, the, uh, the physical layout of the uh, circuit board so you can identify where all the chips are, 
um, schematics, electronic schematics, showing how everything works in there. Uh, some simple flow charts for uh, diagnosing problems and uh, some theory, technical theory operation, how various bits in it in the system works, which is a great help indeed. I also referred to my very well thumbed from the 1980s uh, TOS80 book. Uh, it was very useful for looking up the TOS80 graphics characters with problems with the screen display. Uh, and when we got onto the screen display, um, I needed to look at how the characters decompose into their binary uh, components to work out what was going on. So this, this sheet, ASCII charts, proved extremely useful. I worked on this machine, the one that I got from the Radio Rally first, and my technique was I did a bit of uh, probing around with the Logic Probe, and I did get some... Uh, some way with that of working out some things that were probably wrong um, but in the end the most successful technique was since I had a working Genie 2 and I had another pretty much identical system um, uh, that had spare parts in was to like swap components out basically swap components into the what the working machine and see what stopped it working and I went, it was a very roundabout route. I, um, I swapped all the small chips first because they were a lot easier to get out of their sockets. Um, uh, but in the end, it turned out to be the CPU, the Z80 CPU was just dead in this machine, um, which my early diagnostics should probably have led me to, but it's quite scary to remove um, um, a chip with this many pins without bending or breaking stuff. So I was a bit wary of doing that, particularly when I only had one that I knew definitely worked. But that was the that was the, the main fault with uh, with this machine. Just the CPU was dead, and thankfully they still make them. This one was made in 1980. Uh, the one I replaced it with was made in 2018. So they still make them. They're about five or six pounds each. Um, once I did that, I discovered that there was some corruption on the screen uh, and it turned out to be the, the screen memory um, that RAM chips from the era are known to fail occasionally and, um, and it turned out to be two of the, uh, the screen memory chips uh, which I temporarily borrowed from, uh, from this machine actually because the Genie 2 has different size memory chips in for the video memory. Uh, but I was able to buy replacements off eBay. Uh, for I got five for ten pounds, so not too bad. Uh, they don't make them any longer. The uh, the ones I bought were made back in the eighties, um, but they were unused and worked well. Um, and the final thing wrong with this machine was the tape deck uh, was not working reliably. Uh, it just comes down to the rubber drive belts; they stretch over the years. So I was able to measure those and find a modern replacement that seems to work. Then moving on to this one, the one that was donated to me, this was a lot more of a challenge. Um, getting the, the basics of getting it up and running uh, was relatively straightforward. It also just had a 40 CPU, so another six pounds for the Z80 CPU. Got it up and displaying stuff on the screen, the, the video memory was fine main memory fine it all worked but then the cassette deck gave me more of a problem um, so in these they do they have used lots of different voltages on the circuit board 12 volts 5 volts minus 5 volts and 9 volts which is what they use for the cassette deck and the um, the power wasn't getting through reliably to the cassette deck and the the 9 volts, they don't use like a modern voltage regulator single chip to do it. They had their own circuit. And so I had to get into analogue electronics to try and work out why this circuit that generates the 9 volts wasn't working. And I ended up changing half the components in the circuit. I replaced the capacitor, although I think that was okay. Uh, but it turned out these two were both 40. It's a transistor and a beefy power transistor. Um, so once I replace those, power gets through fine. Um, and also I've um, uh, had to replace the drive belt on this one as well. Uh, there's one final repair I didn't do. 
um, that I explained on this one, um, how there's this switch at the back to do 32 character mode. That switch is broken on this one. Tried to buy a replacement switch. Turned out when it arrived, it's a miniature one rather than a full size one. Um, I hadn't quite realized, so it doesn't fit. So that's still to be done. And with all of them, I um, got these uh, rather funky um, knobs. That all the, the knobs on the back for the video uh, mode and for the reset button, they'd all fallen off on all three genies over the years. And I managed to find uh, this uh, rather nice replacement because I remember from the 80s exactly what these looked and felt like with a little um, depression on the, uh, the end, shy, gloss black. Uh, and I managed to find um, what looks to be like an exact replica from RS components. Uh, they're about a pound each. Um, but at least uh, they're now all kind of cosmetically uh, as they should be. There was one other quite interesting thing on this donated genie. It has this little knob on the side. And when I opened up, I also found a speaker. And that's because this one has had, got a homemade sound mod on it. Uh, that when these machines launched and the TOS 80, they had no sound card. Um, that would have been quite unusual of the era. But programmers found that they could use the cassette interface and use the square wave generation on the cassette interface to do simple tones. So if instead of connecting up a cassette deck, you connected up some kind of amplifier, um, then you could get sound out of it. And so this mod directly um, ties in to the cassette interface um, and puts that out on a speaker with a little volume control, which we can see if I, um, if I save a, um, a program to tape then you can hear the sounds coming out through the cassette interface. So, um, so that means, you, presumably that's why one of the reasons for the volume control is you can turn that down when you're saving. But what games of the era would put sounds out on that, um, that interface and so that means you've got built-in sound for any games, which is really rather cool. Uh, I've talked about what I have fixed uh, but what have I not fixed? Because I've run out of time, it's nearly the end of March and I've got other work to be doing. Um, on both of these, I ran out of time in trying to get the cassettes to work. Uh, cassettes, you know, are notoriously unreliable. Um, uh, of the, at the time, it was quite difficult to get reliable cassette um, uh, recording and playback, which is why this one had the meter and the volume control. So neither of them will um take in data from the cassette uh this one i uh, do on a uh, existing recorded tape because this tape came with the machine um you can see the needle moving but it doesn't go very high so i suspect there's something in the kind of gain circuitry of that this one just doesn't seem to get anything coming in from the cassette and in terms of trying to save op from the computer onto cas the cassette uh, this one doesn't record anything onto the cassette. This one does record something onto the cassette, um, but it's not a particularly good quality signal and it can't read it back. So both of those need some work. Um, I have got some um, schematics of the, the circuitry in the cassette decks and I've had some advice on Twitter from other, from other people about these. It's quite a simple circuit. It's just like an amplifier going each way for getting this signal into the computer. Um, so it's, uh, um, yeah, I should be able to do some of that if I had a bit more time. Ideally, I want to have a look at the analog waveforms of the signals that are going in. So again, that's where an oscilloscope would help, whereas things like logic analyzer and logic probes only give me the on and off signal, digital signals, rather than the varying signals of something analog like the cassettes. Um, but I think it's still within my capabilities to learn how to do this. I'm a software developer by trade. I don't know hardware. The whole point of all these retro challenges has been for me to learn how to keep these machines working. Um, and it's quite, uh, at the time, these were kind of like magical boxes when I learned to program in the 80s. And I, it was always a mystery how they actually worked. So this being an exploration for me of learning how those magic box wor boxes work from scratch 
is really quite exciting to me. So that's a, a little overview on what the Video Genie is, uh, what I've been doing this last month fixing them. Uh, I feel I've got quite a good result uh, that when I started I had two completely dead machines. I've now got two machines that are mostly working. Uh, all the digital side of them is completely working. It's just the cassette decks are still to work on. Um, I've still got stuff to do. Um, I can hopefully fix those cassette decks on a future, uh, future challenge maybe. It'd be really good if I could get an oscilloscope sometime, but they're so expensive to get a decent, decent oscilloscope. Um, and be saving up, so one day I'll have one and I might be able to uh, have some um, uh, shortcuts to doing this. Um, if you find any of this interesting, uh, I've tried to keep this quite high level to make it accessible. If you're interested a little bit more in the details of the pairs, how I went about um, diagnosing them, uh, including lots of dead ends and uh, aha moments as I, as I went through it, you can look back through some of my previous videos. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thank you very much for uh, watching.